Hello, Angel. I can't hear you. Hold on. Emily, will you talk again? Can you hear me now? Good deal. Hello. Thanks for coming today um, and being willing to chat a little bit about environmental ed at Northern Lights with us. Always happy to do it. Do we have people watching? Are there people with us? Let me check it out real quick. When I when I checked a couple minutes ago, we had four people watching along with us. Nice. Thanks yeah. for coming, friends. Yes, yes. All right, we currently have five people watching. Sweet. One of them happens to be Idalise, so that's lovely. Hi, Idalise. Um, so yeah, let's kind of begin. Angel, can we just start, can you tell us, I know it's been a long time since you've been able to do environmental ed in person with the kids, but could you maybe tell us one of your favorite memories from this past year? Yeah, I have a lot of favorite memories, but I think my most favorite activity was going to the river with the kids. It was really cool to get to see the kids explore with a more outdoorsy space that they would expect. So see them engage with the trees and the sand um, and the amount of things they found was crazy. We had kids finding bricks that had things written in them and they were investigating why that might be. Um, and it was just really, really fun, um, especially because it was winter and you don't typically think of rivers in winter and the difference in the landscape. So the kids really got to see how the snow and the ice uh, affect the river, which was wonderful. And I can't wait to do that again this year. Yeah, thank you. Um, how about one of your favorite memories from distance learning? Yeah, distance learning was a challenge at first with environmental ed. It took a lot of thinking to figure out how to do outdoor learning with a computer. So we started on Flipgrid and then switched it. And I think switching it was the best thing we did um, because the kids had a choice board um, or a learning menu and they were able to pick their activities. Um, and I had way too much fun making their videos. Um, it was so much joy getting to go explore the cities and show the kids things. Um, and a few of my favorite memories um, were one, we did an activity with the mouse door art sculptures in the cities. So there's an artist that goes around the cities and makes these tiny little doors that are for mice and puts them out. And then I invited kids to create them. And a couple kids sent me pictures of their own mouse doors that they created that were inspired by the ones they saw, which were super cool. And then one of our other teachers here at Northern Lights shared an activity about growing plants in your socks. Emily, was that you? That might've been it you. Was, yeah, it was me. Yeah. So. Um, the activity was kids went outside in their socks or put their socks over their shoes and ran around and got their socks all muddy and dirty, which kids love. And then they hung them up in their house, um, typically in a bag on a window and your socks would grow and they would um, create plants and other things. And it was really cool when we, at the end of the year, went to kids' houses. Uh, at one of our kids' houses, we got to see their socks in their window growing, which was mm -hmm. super fun. Yeah, it was fun to see that hers has started to sprout a little bit. Um, would you mind sharing this past year one of the, or maybe how about to start off with, can you tell us a little bit what each class uh, period is like structured like during environmental ed? Yeah, so environmental ed um, is an hour together with me um, and 90% of that time, if not more, is spent outside. So the class starts um, with, we did weather graphs and we're tracking the weather um, and we were learning about line graphs and bar graphs and different things to kind of translate from the classroom to environmental ed. And then we would go outside and do some sort of activity or learning experiment of some kind. One day it was raining, so we made boats and tried to float them on water. One day we did a scavenger hunt of nature. Um, and then after that activity, we do discovery-based learning, which is kind of a fancy word for free time. The kids continue their learning and something they're interested in outside. Um, and a lot of times that was with the snow mountain because the snow mountain was amazing last year. And then we would do a reflection together where we talk about um, the risks we took um, and if they were safe choices and how to make sure we stay safe while we're outside, what we learned in that discovery-based learning because it was much more individualized then. So the kids reflected on what they learned um, and then they reflected on what they wanted to continue learning. 
Can you, could you share one of uh, the experiments that you did this year that was really great or one that you like maybe didn't go as planned, but you learned something really cool anyway? Yeah, we'll do one that was super cool and one that didn't go as planned. So one that was super cool, we took water balloons um, and filled them with water, but we filled them with food coloring and we froze them outside and it was the coolest thing. They made ice orbs. So the kids after they would rotate the balloons um, after a day, so the other side would freeze because the kids learned that if they put the balloons in the snow, it insulated so it wouldn't freeze. So they had to rotate the balloon to make sure the whole thing would freeze. But then they peeled the balloons off and had these beautiful, colorful ice orbs that then we tried to stack and create towers with. And they had to learn how to get the snow to freeze so they could stack. And that was just I think a fan favorite. I loved it. And the kids had so much fun. They were just beautiful. And then a project that did not go as planned was our igloo. So we tried to make a rainbow igloo and it was super cool, um, but it takes a very long time to do an igloo the way we did it because we wanted all of the classes to participate. So they made their blocks instead of using like a snow saw, they made them in containers and then would put color in and freeze them and flip them and start building the igloo. And we had a very weird winter and it warmed up. So before we finished our igloo, it all melted and collapsed. So it did not go as planned. We did not get to make a complete igloo. But I think because of that, the kids and I together were able to learn, well, next year we have to make sure we start it sooner um, and maybe find a way to make it faster and how we can put it in a place that stays cold longer and all of these different things. So it didn't go as planned, but it was still really cool. Yeah. I remember that. Thanks for sharing that, Angel. Idalise is following along and she was saying that one of the favorite activities that she saw you do with the kids this year is when you created cat shelters. <laughs> yeah. Um, she really liked that one. Yeah, we that was fun. The kids got into it. We made feral cat shelters um, and did not keep them here. We were not attracting feral cats to the school, but in the community, there's a lot of feral cats. So creating those shelters was a way to um, help give to our community as well as the animals and the kids and I thought it was super cool. It was very fun. Yeah. Thank you, Angel. Um, we have um, a question from one of our current parents who is wondering what the outdoor space might look like this coming year, if we have any plans for it to change um, or what, what's happening around the school grounds. Yeah, so um, lots of change and it's kind of up in the air how it's going to all go. So there is an idea to have garden boxes. We're just trying to get the company of the garden boxes to cooperate. Um, but we want to get lots of growing um, food and other flowers and herbs up in, I call it the front area of the school. So it's the fenced area in the front. Um, we also have a greenhouse and we're hoping to get the greenhouse fixed and move the greenhouse so it can be in a space with the garden boxes so we can plant and have like an area very designated to gardening and growing so the kids can be much more experienced with that. Um, and then in the back of the school is what I call it. It's where the parking lot is. There's an outdoor environmental ed classroom space, um, which is basically a square. Um, and last year it was used for a lot of building and creating, and we're hoping to continue that, but I'm hoping to restructure that so it can be in a safer and more learning environment space outside. Ida Lise actually just shared a video with me that gave lots of inspiration about what we can do with that outdoor space. Um, and she's willing to help me. So there's going to be changes to that outdoor space, but it depends a little bit on when we get the greenhouse moved and garden boxes, but you'll be able to come back and for sure um, see some differences so it can be a little bit more conducive to outdoor learning. Yeah. Thank you, Angel. Um, one of our next questions is a, another parent that's wondering about field trips and what field trips look like um, for environmental ed. Yeah, so um, the number one field trip we'll take more often than any others absolutely is to the river. That's a walking field trip, which are personally my favorite, um, but we will go to the river in all seasons and to explore. Uh, this past year, social distancing um, changed our field trip plans a lot. We had a plan to go camping and do other things. So as this year um, starts, we will do as many field trips as social distancing allows. Um, I love the idea of exploring the community with the kids because part of our urban ecosystem is absolutely at the school, but it's in the surrounding areas. So um, I am hoping we can get kids camping and get kids on walk, nature walks and explorations and things like that. Um, but a lot of it will just depend on what social distancing allows us to do together. 
Thank you, Angel. We have another question from an incoming third grader. And the third grader says, mom said we get to do fires. Do we really? Yes, I love that question. That is a tradition I think is going to be a permanent thing here at Northern Lights. It was so cool. So on Thursdays, we have fire Thursday, which means for your environmental ed, as a student, you make the fire. So now for parents watching, there are um, definitely things put in place for kids to be safe. We have a lot of fire rules that the kids all know and recite and we go over and the kids are like passionate about it. It's almost a mantra of what we do for our fire. We are 25 feet away from buildings. We always have water on hand. We don't bring cardboard unless it's to start the fire. The fire doesn't happen if it's windy outside. There's all of these rules that we follow um, and the kids help come up with so we're safe. But we do every Thursday the kids start a fire and what I mean by the kids start a fire is they actually build the fire in the fire pit so I'll teach them a couple different ways to start a fire from like you know the log cabin or building a house or whatever it is with sticks but the kids do that and then I teach the kids how to safely light a match away from their body to start a fire and they all get to do that um, and then on the fire last year we boiled water um, we did all sorts of cool things so yes you will get to learn all about fires and make them all on your own with an adult very clear. <laughs> yeah. All right, we have another question from a kindergartner, and they're wondering how big is the snow mountain? Oh, man, snow mountain's pretty big. Um, you have to actually walk up it. I would say it depends on how much snow we get. But um, when you come into the parking lot, you'll see a fence and the snow mountain is definitely as tall, if not taller than the fence. It's really good for sledding. And if there's not a lot of snow, we can use our tools to move the snow together and make it taller. We have another question and maybe I'll be able to answer this one. Um, but the question is how often do students go on field trips? And I will say that in our first year, which was last year, um, Two of our classes were able to go on a field trip in December and they went to Fort Snelling and did a Bodote walk and some geocaching. Um, and then we all took a trip to the river in February together. We walked there uh, and then we had plans to go to the river. Angel, I think it was like every three weeks for the rest of the school year. And then we transitioned to distance learning. So we weren't able to do that. And then we had also put in place um, like Angel had mentioned, we were going to, we had the plans to go camping in May with our older kids. Um, our younger, our three youngest classes, we're gonna go to the nature center. And then our three younger classes, again, we're going to go see a play. So we had a lot of things scheduled, slotted for the spring that we weren't able to do um, because we got to do distance learning instead. So that's what it, that's what it looked like last year and like, like Angel had mentioned, um, sort of depending upon what distance learning looks like this year, we'll, we'll take trips to the river again um, very frequently. Yeah. Um, we have another question for you, Angel. Um, what is your favorite activity with the kids in the winter? Oh, that is a great question. Um, I love them all. I would say my favorite from last year was kind of a spur of the day activity. We froze clothing and put it on the mountain and made it look like there were people in the mountain. We, we took clothing outside and we took boiling hot water um, and we got to see that evaporate, which was super cool. And then we soaked all of the clothes um, that we had and in water and stuffed them with snow. The kids got to create their own forms and we had like pants going this way and a shirt that had its arms in a circle. It was very cool. And then we set them on the snow mountain, which was super fun. So I would say that was by far my favorite activity last winter. Um, but in general, I would say my favorite thing to do in the winter with kids is building, creating, and playing with the snow. The snow is so cool. Yeah. It was really cool to look at just how quickly all that clothing froze and it stayed like that for, for a couple of days and then kind of disappeared. But, uh, yeah. uh I have a message for you, Angel from Michelle. And she says that her kindergarten students loved being outside with you. They were outside in rain, shine, snow, and cold temperatures. Her kids learned very quickly how to prepare for all kinds of changes in the weather and still liked to go outside and have fun. 
That's awesome. Thanks for sharing, Michelle. I would say it's it's one of the big things here is kids learn very quickly that there's no such thing as bad weather. There is bad weather clothing. So as long as we're dressed appropriately, we are outside, no matter what, as long as it's safe. Um, and it is a joy. And kids learn that stomping in puddles is just as much fun as wearing a t-shirt in the sunshine. Absolutely. We have, uh, I have another question for you. And this question is, is around discipline and they're wondering how is discipline handled? Yeah, so it's a good question. So next year, there will be an environmental ed assistant teacher. So there will be two of us outside at all times. So um, anything in regards to discipline as a school, we are very focused on restorative justice. So um, making sure people are heard and conversation based and meeting people's needs. And it is always, it's a belief of mine that if there is a behavior being demonstrated that is one that is not wanted in that situation, it's a way a child is communicating something. So that discipline per se will be um, handled through one of the two teachers outside, having a conversation with that student, discovering what need is not being met and meeting the need of that student. So the idea is there is no reason for that student to come inside unless it is unsafe for some reason and they need to come inside. There's enough of us outside that we will be able to hopefully solve the problem through restorative justice and conversation and approaching it as understanding that behavior is a way of communication. And it may not be the way of communication that is desired in that moment, but that can also be a teaching moment of how do you communicate that need instead of screaming and sprinting away, how do you communicate that need in a way that it can be met? So the goal is all behavior will be understood and addressed outside so that the children can maintain outside for that entire hour because we want them always to engage with the outdoor world. And if we need more help, we have lovely people that are always willing to come outside too and help, like Emily. We, we do indeed. Um, thank you, Angel. Um, your next question is what does your five-year vision for what environmental ed at Northern Lights look like? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I would love to see us, first of all, evolve our outdoor space into an area that is suitable for kids of all ages to in conducive of learning and creating. So there'll be a lot of changes outside that will happen throughout the five years through a lot of parent and community support. Um, and then I also see us transitioning to the majority of our learning happening at the river. Um, and that being that space is so magical for kids and allows for a lot more discovery with something as simple as a tree, right? As much as I love our learning here at school, a lot of us are in a parking lot um, and we want to expand from that parking lot to the further community. So I see us expanding a lot that way. And then another really big thing that will change is it'll be a lot more focused on collaboration with the classroom versus environmental ed being separate. The idea of environmental ed is, is an extension of what we're doing in the classroom and what we're doing outside is, an ex is inside is an extension of what we're doing outside. So it won't be a separate class per se, it will just be continued learning. Right, so there'll be changes in collaboration that comes as we become um, more set as a school and more collaboration time happens, but sometimes that is slowly, but I think just even this next year, you'll see that more of the learning that kiddos will do will be an extension of what they're doing inside and more of the learning they'll be doing inside will be an extension of what they're doing outside. Thanks, Angel. Um, Angel, you talked a lot about going outside and Michelle mentioned this, right? About going outside in rain or shine, or if it's really cold, how do you make sure that kids have what they need to be able to be present, I guess, without complaining about being cold or wet? Yeah, so a couple of things. The first thing is a lot of it is teaching. Um, we, I talked a little bit about doing a weather graph um, and the concept of understanding that negative 15 degrees is cold has to be taught, especially for younger kiddos. You, cold is so relative, right? Kids are like, oh, cold like opening the freezer or cold like I need a sweater. No, cold like you want your face covered. So a lot of it is through conversation and teaching. And so when it gets cold like that, we meet inside first in an environmental ed classroom and we have a conversation and do a check. Does everyone have warm socks, boots, snow pants, jackets, um, face coverings, hats, mittens, gloves? And when kids don't, um, last year we were fortunate enough to get a grant. So we now have snow pants, um, boots and face coverings and gloves and everything your kiddos could need 
Um, so when kids don't have what they need, cause it happens or they just forgot it, or you were really busy that morning. So it's still in the washer because your kid was playing in the mud the other day, we have extras here. So, um, it is a lot of teaching and a lot of working together, but there is always a check too, right? Do we have our mittens? Do we have our hats? Do we have our socks? Mm -hmm. Socks was a big one last year. Kids did not like to wear socks, but through conversation, they learned very quickly. Socks are important when it's cold. So it is just a teachable moment, just like anything else. Um, and then we also understand it's better to have more than less because if it's 32 good degrees outside, right, it's freezing te technically, but if you're running around, you're going to get warm and you might not want three jackets on. But if you brought three jackets and you take one off, that's better than needing an extra one. Yes. Thanks, Angel. So I have one final question for you, and that is what are you most looking forward to this um, uh, during this upcoming school year? Uh, selfishly seeing the kids in person. That is more because of distance learning. I miss seeing kids um, so much and doing our goofy handshakes and our riddles, um, and I cannot wait to see kids in person. But outside of that, I am really, really excited to environmental ed making more of a switch to extended learning from the classroom. I think um, all of us will enjoy that more in a different light and it'll be really cool that what we're doing outside is continued and not just one hour of your day. It's all hours of your day. And I think um, the kindergartners in Michelle's class experienced that a little bit last year with the Daily Street Project um, and they loved it and I loved it and Michelle loved it. I think pretty sure. So um, I think that will continue. Um, and that's what I really can't wait to see. Yeah, great. Thanks for sharing that. I'm also really excited for children to be back in the building. Um, Angel, unless there's anything else you want to share. Um, I don't have anything. Uh, remember your fire safety. If you were here last year, and if you weren't here last year, start thinking about your fire safety so we can get to fires right away. Yes, yes, yes. Well, Angel, thank you for taking the time this morning to talk to us a little bit about environmental education at School of Northern Lights. Um, we are really excited for you to come back and be with us uh, in the fall. I can't wait. Thanks so much, guys. All right. Thank you. Take care.